everyone! Welcome to episode number 608 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My guests this week are Jack Ferrari and Johanna Pingle from MathWorks, and we're talking all about Edge AI. We discuss the trends and technologies driving the adoption of Edge AI applications, the common challenges associated with Edge AI, and the roles that the maintenance and upkeep of machine learning models, over the air updates, and on device training will play for the future of Edge AI applications. All right, without further ado, please welcome Jack and Johanna to Fish Fry. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Thank you. And hi, Jack. Thank you for joining me. Great to be here as well. Thanks, Amelia. Absolutely. Okay, so Joanna, set the stage for us here. What are some of the trends and technologies that are driving Edge AI's adoption across many different industries? Sure, I'm happy to set the scene. I think it's important to note that AI started off, in my opinion, relatively slowly to be adopted into industry. It was confined primarily to, let's say, research papers and academia and building specialized models. One I remember back in the day was AlexNet, which was created and got everyone excited that everything in AI was about to change. But I would say that's back in 2014. And the ability for companies to actually take advantage of that technology took a few more years to actually be practical. So over the years, we've actually seen AI become more mainstream, and that's driven primarily because of extra computational power like GPUs, and then also data availability, how easy it is to get good training data. And now we're in an era where the adoption is really everywhere. And so this sets the scene for the rise of Edge AI. And there's a few key drivers of the popularity of Edge AI, but I wanted to talk specifically about the general trends in AI. And now I'll pass it off to Jack to talk specifically more about Edge AI. So as Joanna mentioned, there's been this explosion and massive growth of data being generated at the edge as IoT devices have been adopted across many different industries. And with all that new data, if we want to take advantage of the power of AI, historically, that's been done so in the cloud. And with all this new data, that's a lot of data to send to the cloud to train AI models, to run inference there, and then return results to edge devices. And so the whole kind of idea behind edge AI or trend of edge AI is breaking the dependency from the cloud and analyzing and making inferences with AI models on that data very close to the source on the edge. And a few trends in both hardware and software have really enabled this growth in recent years. On the hardware side, we've seen new hardware architectures become released. I think I saw a recent podcast that discussed NPUs or neural processing units. Those are kind of ASICs designed specifically for high performance inference of machine learning models on edge devices. And they're really enabling deployment of AI models at greater scale to the edge. I think that it's a relatively new technology, but it's a very good step in the right direction towards enabling more models running on the edge. That being said, though, there's many advancements also happening that are allowing machine learning models of greater sophistication and size to run very efficiently and on very kind of run-of-the-mill microcontrollers that are all over the place already today with IoT devices. Specifically, like some leading microcontroller vendors are introducing new you know, vector extensions and the latest generation of these microcontrollers to really optimize the machine learning tasks that they anticipate will run on these devices. On the software side as well, there's some tools and frameworks being developed that are making it a lot easier to deploy AI models to the edge. You know, typically or historically, this has required a, quite a bit of expertise, both in embedded systems and machine learning. Uh, and it's been hard to find people with those proper skill sets. But more tools are becoming available that are making the kind of barrier to adoption you know, not as great and making it easier to get any AI model running on an edge device. And of course, as Joanna mentioned, there's been this evolution in the architecture of machine learning models over the last decades. And Recently, there have been many innovations and new model architectures that are being designed with edge deployment in mind. So they're kind of 
lean and mean models that will run with good performance on edge devices. So yeah, lots of trends, lots of items happening here. So really exciting. It is. Now, Jack, what do you think are the benefits engineers can expect when using edge AI? So I think there's four primary benefits that edge AI offers over cloud AI or running AI in the cloud. So the first would be lower latency. This translates to faster decision making. There are several industries adopting edge AI that I think are doing so primarily because of this uh, benefit. Off the top of my head, I can think of you know use cases in automotive, manufacturing, and healthcare where faster decision making is very important. As we're not running the AI model in the cloud, we don't need to wait for any sort of latency with a result to be returned to the device, maybe to make a future decision. So that's the big primary benefit. There's a few others as well. Number two would be lower costs. So for an IoT device, some of the most energy intensive tasks can be processing things over the network, sending data over the network. And as we have this reduced need for networking now with Edge AI, we can lower the energy consumption of the IoT devices, perhaps even start running them with battery instead of you know connections to AC power. The next way we can lower costs with Edge AI is as we're not so much dependent on the cloud as much anymore, we don't have to pay as much to store any data on the cloud for training models or to run the inference on the cloud and you know wait for results to be returned. So we can take better advantage of this cost-efficient hardware on the edge. The third benefit is enhanced privacy and security. As we no longer need to transmit any information over the network, especially if that's potentially sensitive information or information about a user that could personally identify them, because we can just do all the compute locally now, there's fewer kind of avenues for attack from any outsiders, which is a great advantage to Edge AI. Finally, the fourth benefit would be and just improve reliability and uptime. Because we no longer have to account for any network failures or outages, we can be sure that the Edge AI model you know, will be running. As long as the device has power, we can ensure that it'll be running. So there'll be fewer instances of downtimes there. That makes sense. Now, Jack, what do you think are the most common challenges associated with Edge AI? Sure, yeah. So Edge AI has lots of benefits, but it definitely comes with some challenges. That doesn't mean people aren't making this easier, but there are still some challenges to be aware of today. I think the primary challenge that I think most people struggle with from the outset is you know, approaching this compute platform on the edge that typically has limited hardware resources. Most AI models, not all, I say most are developed you know, kind of with the luxury of cloud compute and training in mind and they may include some types of machine learning operations that are maybe very exotic and new and maybe difficult to translate to maybe you know a low level embedded friendly language like C very easily from a higher level language like Python. And so it can be difficult to sometimes take an AI model and make sure that it will both fit on a smaller hardware platform and also easily be translated into C, C++, a language that can easily be compiled and run on that device, especially if it's a bare metal device with no operating system. That said, though, there's been great strides in recent years to make this process a lot easier, but it can still be a challenge to know beforehand if a model you have is going to fit on a device at the end of the day, and also how fast it might run if that might meet your kind of requirements for throughput that you have in your application. I think another interesting challenge, too, that we're seeing several solutions coming out for at the moment is this idea of once you train a model and kind of release it out into the wild on some edge device, in the case or the circumstances where, you know, the data it starts operating on is maybe different or maybe very, very different from what it was trained on, how do users maintain and kind of update those machine learning models over time? I think we're seeing kind of two primary approaches to this. The first is with over-the-air updates. So if any IoT device has a network connection, and it's collecting data, maybe we start to see that its performance is falling. Maybe that's a trigger to collect some of that additional data we didn't have previously, retrain the model, and then deploy the new version of it over the air, over the internet to the device. And the other solution we see coming out is incremental learning or on-device training, where we actually retrain the model itself right there on the device and you know, not in some data center. I'll jump in as well, because I think this bears repeating. Jack's talking about incremental machine learning, and it's been generating a lot of buzz recently, and it's a trend that we're really excited about. So if you think of a model that can be trained on a device, which is exactly what Jack is talking about for Edge AI, if new data comes in, then 
the model needs to be prepared to analyze that. And if it's never seen that data before, it could cause problems in accuracy or even errors in output. So imagine a world where you can retrain a model on the device with new data that becomes available. And then this opens up so many new benefits, maybe things like personalized devices, where every device could be different based on every end user, or maybe more realistically, the ability to just handle new data without having to train it off device. I'll also plug a webinar that Jack did recently on how to incrementally train models in MATLAB. And that was how I learned first about incremental machine learning. And it was actually really exciting to see the benefits that come from incremental machine learning and the practical implementations of that as well. So of course, there's a few challenges, but in general, we think that this trend is one to keep an eye out for with tools like MATLAB and Simulink, which can help engineers learn how to implement this on their devices as well. So Joanna, can you share a couple edge AI use cases that are applicable across multiple industries? Sure. One area that I'm particularly excited about is predictive maintenance. And I think a lot of people can relate to this application as well. So the idea of finding and fixing devices before they break, which can save businesses a lot of time and money in the process. Say you have a company that makes electrical systems and your job is to estimate how long a component can last before it becomes irrelevant or breaks. You want to proactively replace that because if you wait too long, it could shut down unexpectedly and then you lose a lot of time in terms of operations. And this example is actually a real life example. Schneider Electric did this. The team wanted to keep the systems operational, but then also monitor all of the component health at the same time. So they decided to embed the AI algorithm directly on the component. And so using MATLAB and Simulink, they were able to create a predictive maintenance algorithm and generate the code that turned a manual process into an automated one. And one thing that Jack mentioned earlier is that whole expertise and skill set. What was interesting about this example as well is that these were not AI experts when they first started, but they were still able to create the algorithm and embed that on device and kind of learn the process as they went. So this is one example that we're seeing that predictive maintenance is an area where businesses are seeing practical implementations of edge AI. That's great. I think another really awesome use case we're seeing customers really flock to with edge AI is with virtual sensors or software-based sensors. And the idea with these is that they combine data from other physical sensors that's readily available to make predictions or estimates of new values of interest that previously would have been very difficult or very expensive to measure directly. As an example, uh, you can think of battery state of charge as a good application for this. Measuring the state of charge of a battery is very difficult and expensive to do uh, directly. However, you know it's been found that AI models are a great solution uh, for this problem as they can pick up on and start to understand the kind of nonlinear relationships between other measurements of interest like voltage and current and temperature and how those relate to the actual state of charge of a battery. So we've seen uh, several large automotive OEMs very interested in this approach for battery state of charge with virtual sensors as they can implement you know, accurate predictions of this value you know, to drivers of cars without having to worry about you know, how they'll make that measurement directly on the vehicle. Another interesting use case of virtual sensors you can imagine is predicting tire wear from kind of time series data from the history of a vehicle speed, uh, mileage, and the habits of the driver. Something that I think as well would be quite difficult to measure directly or through another method. So we're starting to see more of these use cases pop up where we have some other values of interest that we can use to train a model that can actually predict totally unrelated things. So it's been very interesting to see that uptake and adoption. Um, In one case, Goshen, a manufacturer of EV battery packs, used MathWorks tools to train an AI-based virtual sensor for battery state of charge and then deploy that to an automotive ECU with automatic code generation. Super cool. All right. Well, Jack, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Sure. It's a tough question. I thought a while about it. I ultimately landed on a lasagna dish that I had in Italy when I was there earlier this year. Specifically in Bologna, they have a specialty. It's this like spinach-based pasta. It's like a green lasagna bolognese. It's 
absolutely out of this world. It's awesome. I highly recommend it. I'm not usually like a lasagna person when I go to Italian restaurants, but they do it extremely well there. So I guess you got to go to the source. It sounds amazing. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Jack. No worries. Thank you, Amelia. And thank you for joining me, Joanna. Always a pleasure. Happy to be here. If you'd like more information about MATLAB and Simulink for Edge AI, or to watch a new webinar called On-Device Training of Machine Learning Models with MATLAB and Simulink, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And of course, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is jock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and our new animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of November 8th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>